Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, in violation, the Minneapolis chief of police handed down a scathing rebuke of Derek Chauvin's use of force against George Floyd from the witness stand. To continue to apply that level of force, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. We'll bring you much more from the testimony of the city's top cop and what we're expecting from the courtroom this morning as the trial resumes. Shot for shot, concerns over a possible fourth coronavirus wave are boiling over in Michigan, where the daily case count is the highest it's been since December. We'll take you behind this latest surge and how the state is ramping up efforts to stop the spread. Race against time, crews in Manatee County, Florida are working around the clock to avoid disaster as hundreds of millions of gallons of water are pumped out of that toxic compromise reservoir. The latest on their efforts and the potential environmental impact. And seeking the summit, the five and a half mile high destination for some of the world's bravest thrill seekers is back in business. That's right, Mount Everest has reopened after a lengthy COVID shutdown. A look at how one adventurer is taking her return to normal to new heights. Something that is very much not normal for most of us, but actually I have a fun fact for you this morning, Joe. Yes. My best friend's grandfather is the oldest American to summit the mountain and he's actually done it twice. Wow. Cool, right? That is very cool. Maybe we could do it. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> now, now at least the mountain's open to try. <laughs> we'll get to that later, but we start this morning with what could be the most consequential day in the murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin. Some of the most experienced members of the force are testifying against him in the trial. That includes his former boss, Minneapolis Police Chief Madera Arredondo, who took the stand yesterday. It is contrary to our training to indefinitely place um, your knee on a prone, handcuffed individual for an indefinite period of time. An inspector with the Minneapolis Police Department also took the stand and testified that Chauvin's restraint using his knee on George Floyd's neck was improvised. She was in charge of training for the force at the time of Floyd's death. So per policy, uh, a neck restraint is compressing one or both sides of the neck using an arm or leg. But what we train is using uh, one arm or two arm to do a, a neck restraint. And how does this differ? I don't know what kind of improvised position that is. So that's not what we train. All right. And the doctor who pronounced George Floyd dead testified that asphyxia was the likely cause. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Minneapolis. So Shaq, tell us more about the key takeaways from yesterday and how the defense tried to counter the testimony of these high-ranking witnesses. Well, Joe, it was definitely a big day of testimony yesterday, as we heard from the chief of police taking the stand. But you heard not only from the police chief, but you also heard from the sergeant uh, in charge of training at the time. Both say that the actions that you saw Derek Chauvin take on that day against George Floyd did not comply with the police department policy. And the police chief was very clear about that. He said not only did it not comply with the policy, but it also was in conflict with the ethics and values of this police department. This is something that, you know, definitely connected with the jurors. When you look at the pool reporters, those two reporters inside of the courtroom, they were taking notes during his testimony. They were looking at him, watching him explain the different techniques and practices being used. You heard the defense mention some similar claims that they've been mentioning before in their line of questioning in that cross-examination. You heard them bring up the size of the crowd. You also heard them bring up the fact that the police chief hasn't been out arresting people uh, frequently. He's a senior level uh, he's at a senior level position. So that's definitely a point you hear the defense trying to make repeatedly during this testimony. Just so, Shaq, what should we expect in the courtroom today? Well, we don't get that specific guidance from the prosecution team, but we did get a sense of some of the arguments, some of the testimony to come as they were uh, talking and conferring with the judge yesterday. We do know the focus right now is on the use of force, examining Chauvin's use of force and having those witnesses come up and say what Chauvin was trained to do and then compare that with what he actually did. So we believe at least two more 
uh, active police officers will be coming up, taking the stand. The judge said he doesn't want to have a series of people coming up and expressing their opinion specifically on what Chauvin did. Instead, these uh, experts will come up and talk about the training received by the officers. That was a big focus yesterday from those senior level officers, especially the chief. You'll continue to hear a little bit more of that today. We know at some point we'll move into the medical aspect of this and the cause of death. Joe. All right. Shaquille Brewster, thank you so much. Let's now bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savallo. Danny, good morning. Let's get right to some of that testimony from yesterday. So that inspector used the word improvised to talk about Derek Chauvin using his knee on George Floyd's neck to restrain him. And here's what the police chief said. Did you see any indication that Mr. Floyd was actively resisting as that term is defined in Minneapolis Police Department policy? I, I did not um, observe Mr. Floyd to be actively resisting. Now, Danny, what impact does the inspector and the police chief testifying against former officer Chauvin have on this trial? The prosecution is very cleverly blurring the lines between expert testimony and lay witness testimony. Really, these are not, the chief is not an expert in use of force. Neither was the lieutenant from the other day. But these witnesses certainly have a ton of experience with arrests. Yeah, sure, the police chief hasn't arrested anybody in a long time. But look, I'm sure he looks at plenty of body cam video. He's familiar with all the uh, policies, the procedures. He's not qualified as an expert, but you better believe the jury is going to look at somebody with a lot of scrambled eggs on their shoulder pads and say, hey, that's somebody who sure knows what he's talking about. Even if he hasn't been qualified as an expert, his opinion on use of force carries some weight. Mm, absolutely. Danny, let's listen now to the doctor that was on the stand yesterday. Was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. And, and doctor, is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia. Now, Danny, I want to ask you about the effect that that medical opinion can have on the defense team's argument about George Floyd's health and drug habits as the cause of death. But I also want you to speak to, if you can, sort of what we're going to eventually see her as the battle of the experts, because the defense will likely call their own, who might say something opposite, conflicting. What does that do to the mind of a jury? How do they weigh that? I had sympathy for this ER doctor testifying, because, look, the definition, the nature of being an ER doctor is you are responding to patients without a full picture of their medical mm. history, of the information. They're unconscious. You don't get to do an autopsy. You don't. Sometimes you never find out all the facts. So, and you can see that in his body language. Yes, he's a doctor. Yes, he's highly trained. But the nature of his job is that he's not going to have the same conclusive testimony that an expert, uh, the person who performed the autopsy, the defense's experts are going to have about the cause of death. So. Helpful to the prosecution, some inroads for the defense, but ultimately the real battle of experts is yet to come. Mm. And Danny, the defense wants to play more of Officer Chauvin's body cam footage. Now, the judge ruled that they would only be allowed to show the parts that show Chauvin's demeanor and actions immediately after Floyd was taken to the hospital. Now, with a case that started because of an emotional viral video of this police encounter, what's the defense's strategy here? What else is on that body cam footage that they do want to? introduce here. I'm not second guessing the judge, but in a case that's so heavy with video, you might think that almost all the video uh, is relevant, but likely it's a relevance issue. Uh, but if you're the defense and you have anything in there that shows something to the degree of uh, sympathy, empathy, maybe even remorse or something to the effect of uh, that this was not the intended outcome, that could help the defense. But uh, you know, these evidence battles really laid a foundation for a possible appeal later later on. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Thank you. Health officials in Michigan are racing to beat another surge in coronavirus cases. Right now, the Great Lakes state leads the nation in new cases of COVID-19, with more than 10,000 infections confirmed in just the last day. Hoping to get ahead of the virus, the state just expanded vaccine eligibility to all residents 16 and older. 
For more on that, let's bring in NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson. She joins us now from Lansing. So, Priscilla, Michigan has seen this steady increase in cases over the last several weeks. Does the state know what's behind this troubling trend? Well, Joe, good morning. A, a very troubling trend. Even in just the past two weeks, we're talking at a, about a more than 116 percent increase in cases. And I want to put your question to someone who is in the day to day of this work. I'm here with Dr. Meredith Hill, director of emergency medicine here at Sparrow Hospital in Lansing. Doctor, talk to me about what you're seeing in the hospital here and what do you think is behind this spike in cases? So we're definitely seeing a very dramatic increase, especially over the past few weeks. And we're seeing it in a younger population than we were the first couple times around. Um, What could be causing it? I mean, certainly, you know, our older population is now vaccinated, and I think that's offering a lot of protection to them, you know, and to those that have comorbidities. But also, you know, I think people are tired of COVID. People are letting their guards down, not wearing masks as diligently as before. Um, I know schools are back in session. Um, There have been a lot of outbreaks related to sports and extracurricular activities. So I think all of that plays a part. And at this point, what do you feel like needs to happen in order to turn the situation around? Well, you know, I do think there's hope on the horizon with more and more vaccines getting into people's arms every day. Um, I think we just really need to stay diligent. We need to stay the course, keep wearing our masks, keep maintaining physical distancing and get vaccinated as soon as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, And for you, looking ahead, you know, we're hearing experts say there's a possibility of a fourth wave. There's some uh, question about that. What do you make of that? Do you feel like you all could be headed towards a fourth wave? Oh, yeah. We're in it right now. I mean, we're seeing so many cases, um, especially over the past few weeks. Um, It's been pretty dramatic. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. Thank you. Uh, And Joe, there you have it. And uh, that's some of what we're hearing from the governor as well, that at this point, it really is going to come down to mask wearing and vaccinations to try to get this situation under control. Joe? All right, Priscilla, thanks to you and thanks to Dr. Hill, hoping they can turn the situation around there in Michigan. Ahead of President Biden's May 1st goal to make every adult American eligible for COVID-19 vaccination, many states are already moving in that direction. That includes Virginia, where the president is set to visit a vaccination site today. With more on this, NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. Shannon, good morning. Now, we expect to hear from President Biden today on the state of vaccinations. What's he anticipated to say? How are we doing there? Well, I think one of those points you just highlighted, and is that to try and get states to expand who is eligible. Virginia is one of those states. They just started vaccinating a wide range of essential workers. And by mid-April, they're going to expand vaccination to all people over age 16. So that is what President Biden wants to see. A lot of states are moving in that direction, but not all of them yet. We can also expect to hear him touting these record numbers we've been seeing the past few days of vaccinations administered per day. There were four million shots given in a single day over the weekend. So, again, the Biden administration says that really shows they're heading in the right direction. Uh, But, of course, there is also this message, too, of trying to get people to hang on and continue those mask wearing, social distancing uh, mitigation measures just a little bit longer, as you heard that Michigan doctor just saying, uh, because as the administration keeps warning over and over again they're seeing troubling signs and an increase in new cases and they want to make sure we don't see what's happening in michigan happening across the country absolutely but there is that big question because even here in new york as eligibility expands the supply the medical personnel it all's got to come along with that now shannon let's turn to the president's push on infrastructure and how he plans to pay for his two trillion dollar plan now the obvious answer to that is tax hikes but he's having an issue with that even within his own party senator manchin said yesterday that he is not up for this major corporate tax hike as well as other moderate democrats what's he going to do about this if he can't get it done even within his own party. Right. And, you know, it's a great point when people talk about getting rid of the filibuster or going through reconciliation. Well, that doesn't do much help if you Mm -hmm. don't have 50 votes from Democrats. And of course, that tie breaking vote 
from the vice president. So the White House is trying to thread this needle between Democrats on the far left end of the party who want to see a package even bigger. And they're not really that concerned about deficits. And then, of course, you have the more moderate camp led by uh, Joe Manchin, as well as some moderates in the House who are not only concerned about debts and deficits, but also concerned about this increase on the corporate tax rate. Now, there does appear to be some wiggle room there with Manchin. Maybe 28 is too high, but 25 percent of a corporate tax rate, that seems like something he could be for and maybe some adjustments the White House could make. Shannon, finally, I want to ask you about one of the other big issues facing the administration. That's the situation at the southern border. A new poll by the Associated Press NORC found 40 percent of Americans disapprove of the administration's handling of the surge in unaccompanied children at the border. How's the White House responding on this issue? Well, this immigration issue is by far uh, the the weakest performing area for Biden. But, you know, I will say even the White House isn't saying they're doing an excellent job here. Listen to what uh, Press Secretary Jen Psaki had to say yesterday. There's no question this is a difficult challenge, and the president believes he was elected to address hard problems. And his focus right now is on expediting processing at the border, opening up additional facilities, addressing the root causes, and uh, restarting programs to incentivize kids from applying from within within their countries. So that's his focus right now. So certainly something the White House is even saying is a work in progress and something they would like to see improved on. They say they're doing that and telling people just hang on, hang in there a while longer. Shannon, thank you so much. Thank you. The CDC says more young people are testing positive for the coronavirus, especially those who play sports. I want to sort of underscore that this is among 18 to 24 year olds where we're seeing actually um, some peaks in in cases. And many of these, as I noted, are related to um, extracurricular activities and and youth sports, which is why we really want to remain vigilant with regard to the guidance there, as well as um, uh, Uh, testing strategies that could help prevent clusters. Let's bring in Dr. Louisa Petrie. She is a cardiologist and professor at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. So, doctor, many in this age group are not yet vaccinated. In many places, they aren't even eligible or just recently became eligible. Is that one of the main reasons we're seeing a rise in cases among young people? We definitely see a new contour of this pandemic as most of uh, 65 and older people have been vaccinated. Now we are seeing the large drive of this pandemic being between younger people. And it's attributed, as you mentioned before, to uh, playing sports. Mental uh, health and well-being is very dependent on physical activities in this age group. And with schools reopening, we are seeing now an uptick in this younger population. And even if the silver lining is that they are less affected by this disease, we still know that 30 percent become long hauler, even if you mild symptoms like uh, mental fogness, depression or fast heart rate. But when it comes to sports, not all sports are equal. Everything that's outdoor doesn't involve uh, sharing equipment. It's much safer. Now, health experts say these new variants are hitting younger age groups especially hard, especially compared with what we've seen over the last year. Do we know why that is yet? Two points here. One, as we said, the elderly people have been already vaccinated and we see more younger people being uh, sick. And second, this new variant like B117, which is uh, accountable for more than 30 percent in cases in the U.S. right now, we know it's more contagious and can lead to more severe disease. We do see more younger people uh, occupying ICUs and requiring oxygen right now, and it's definitely to blame to the variants. And doctor, let's talk about something that we've all become quite familiar with over the last year. The CDC has changed its recommendation for cleaning surfaces, basically saying a good cleaning with soap and water is fine for most surfaces. So all that disinfectant that we've stocked away, locked away, we're not getting rid of. (laughs) When should we use that? Yes, they just relaxed the guidelines and what they say, the old fashioned soap and water and detergents work for surfaces that are not exposed to COVID. However, those public areas like public schools, buses, they still should be uh, uh, cleaned with a stronger disinfectant. So the guidelines, the, the surface hasn't been exposed in 24 hours, just soap and water would be enough. All right, but we're going to hold on to those Lysol wipes just yes. All right, Dr. Petrie, thank you so much. Appreciate it. 
Those are still hard to find, actually. They are. <laughs> Let's get a check on your morning news now. Why the fine Bill keeping mine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, Karens, and good news for both of you. I did not need my jacket yesterday, so I was right. It's very good. Yeah, it's it's another one of those, you know, bring your jacket with you and then carry it home type <laughs> days. Uh, yeah, it was beautiful. And so many spots around the country yesterday. And it continues today, guys. We have some minor problems out there. And my apologies to the people in, you know, right along the Wyoming and also Idaho border where it's snowing in the higher terrain this morning. It's going to be snowing in southern Montana here, too. But that's the exception. The rule is that it's a gorgeous day. We will see isolated severe storms. We had a few yesterday. We had a lot of large hail reports in Minnesota, especially around Minneapolis. Slight risk of severe storms today will form late this afternoon, this evening, central Kansas, and then it will push towards Manhattan, Topeka, St. Joseph, and Kansas City, and even Wichita later on tonight. Tomorrow, I think, is the day we could see a little more widespread severe storms. We do have the possibility of a few tornadoes and damaging wind, Memphis, Little Rock, and also areas around Shreveport. But the big story has to be these temperatures. I mean, it's just way too early in the spring for this, but I mean, everyone's loving it. 80 today almost in Chicago, Pittsburgh at 75, St. Louis at 83, New York once again near 70 degrees, and it lasts right into Wednesday, too, with our nation's capital in the mid to upper 70s. Uh, it's happening quickly. Everything is it's greening up in the northern half of the country. The flowers are out. The trees are blooming. But if you're an allergy sufferer, you know, I'll take your complaints and I'll will, uh, you know, I'll say hold on just another week or two. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful, though. They are. They're blooming down by my house. All right, Bill. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Coming up, the latest on that toxic Florida reservoir on the brink of collapse. How officials are looking to address the environmental issues that may be on the horizon up next. In the news this Tuesday morning, Florida Congressman Matt Gates says he is absolutely not resigning in a Washington Examiner op-ed. Representative Gates faces an investigation into child sex trafficking against him. He denies the allegations and writes, I'm a representative in Congress, not a monk, and certainly not a criminal. A longer than usual wildfire season has forced Wisconsin's governor to declare a state of emergency. So far this year, more than 1,400 acres have burned across the state. Governor Tony Evers signed the executive order yesterday as the state braces for gusty winds and low humidity levels, conditions that could fuel those fires. The order allows the National Guard and the Department of Natural Resources to work together to fight the fires. And one award-winning m- m- musician got a gig you might not expect. We're talking about Patrick Carney, one half of the rock group, The Black Keys. He's also a lifelong Cleveland Indians fan. And during the home opener yesterday, he filled in for the team's drummer, John Adams, banging away on a big drum in the left field bleachers. You see, Adams is recovering from heart surgery. He had not missed a home opener since 1973. Carney was happy to pinch hit, telling the Associated Press, when I heard he wasn't healthy enough to make it, I thought it was a good way to pay some respect to him and show him some love. Oh. Also, just like, what a fun gig. Just literally every time, the I guess, the Cleveland team comes to bat, they just hit the drum. Yeah, cool so. that they've, they've got their own band. And, and we're thinking about him in his recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully next home opener. Yeah, More yeah, games exactly. This All right. The only one he'll miss. All right, yeah. thanks, Joe. Crews are working around the clock to prevent a toxic wastewater reservoir from collapsing in Florida. They're using pumps and vacuum trucks to drain hundreds of millions of gallons of water out of the Piney Point Reservoir, dumping it into nearby Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Residents living in this area have been told to evacuate over fears of possible flooding if the reservoir does collapse. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins me now from Palmetto, Florida. Ellison, good morning. So are crews any closer to stopping this from collapsing? It sounds like they have made some headway in actually draining it, but where are we at right now? Yeah, well, state and local officials seem to be more optimistic in terms of preventing a collapse. Yesterday, they said they were able to double the daily rate of wastewater that they were draining. They were draining about 35 million gallons of this wastewater every day into the Manatee Port and then into Tampa Bay. They said by uh, last night they were going to have that more than doubled between 75 and 100 millions of gallons draining every single day. That's because they have more pumps that are up and operational now. They have over 20 pumps working to drain this water out of the leaking reservoir. And they also have 10 vacuums. So they say all of that is putting them in a better position in terms of 
preventing a collapse. They are draining this water to prevent the collapse. They are doing controlled drains. It is an emergency step. Obviously, draining this wastewater into the bay is another issue. But in terms of just preventing a collapse and potentially catastrophic flooding into nearby homes and neighborhoods, officials seem to be getting a little bit more optimistic uh, as, as they're able to drain more water. Savannah. Yeah, catastrophic is right. Yesterday we were reporting potentially 10 to 20 feet flooding. So that was why they were evacuating people. Now, Ellison, there were initially concerns that the water was radioactive. That was that turned out to not be the case, thankfully. Now there are concerns over a second breach, but state officials also say that's not the case. What happened there? Yes. Yeah, so yesterday we heard in the afternoon from the director of public safety in Manatee County that in the morning around 2 a.m. This was yesterday. There was an infrared drone that was going over this leaking reservoir and they noticed signs, indications of possibly a second breach. In the afternoon, they had engineers out there from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Florida Department of Envir Environmental Protection, as well as the company that actually owns this site, HRK Holdings, looking to try and see if there actually was a second breach. By last night, they said that they were able to determine that there was not a second breach. The county here, uh, in a tweet, they confirmed those findings that came from the Department of Environmental Protection in this state and also said that they will have more detailed information following the Army Corps assessment in the coming days. Savannah. And Ellison, let's also talk about the environmental impact now, because, of course, it's great news that hopefully that they have this under control. It would be great news if no homes are impacted, if there isn't that flooding. But millions of gallons of toxic wastewater are now just going straight into Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. What could be the long lasting impact of this? And what are state and local officials doing to address that issue? Yes, I mean, there really are kind of layers of issues and concerns here. This is not a simple problem uh, by any means. So the wastewater itself is a mix of salt water, wastewater that is a byproduct of manufacturing fertilizer. Remember, this is an idled phosphate plant. And then also rainfall. These reservoirs, they call them ponds, but they are big open air reservoirs. They haven't been in use, so they filled with rainwater and storm runoff over the years. The water itself, officials say it is not radioactive, but it sits in a liner that sits inside gypsum stacks, which is another byproduct of manufacturing fertilizer. And the gypsum stacks are radioactive. But again, the wastewater itself, officials say that is not radioactive. So. And they also say, which this is important to put out, they also say that that water is not harmful to humans, but there are high levels of nitrogen and phosphate uh, within this water. And high levels of those nutrients have been known to cause harmful algal blooms, which can lead to things like red tides. We talked to an expert who knows all things water in this area. Listen to some of what she had to say. And it's certainly not an ideal situation, but it's a less catastrophic um, situation than the loss of human life. So Tampa Bay um, is actually a relatively healthy bay, but these are extremely high concentrations of nutrients that we're talking about, which is certainly not an ideal situation for a body of water that we want to protect. One thing to remember here, and a lot of frustration locally, is that this is not a new issue. What has what to do with this leftover wastewater has been a discussion, an issue in this area for nearly two decades. This could have been avoided, and there is a lot of frustration that more wasn't done earlier. The governor has said that they will hold the company currently uh, in charge of overseeing who owns this property, HRK Holdings, responsible for any fallout uh, from this. Savannah. Ellison, you said it, layers and layers of issues, my goodness, but hopefully we are able to, as that expert just pointed out there, save all human life, which is, of course, the most important. Ellison, thank you so much for the important context. Human smugglers are apparently turning to social media platforms like Facebook to openly advertise their services. They're trying to connect with migrants who are hoping to seek refuge in the U.S. And at times they're falsely promising a 100 percent safe journey across the border. NBC News Justice correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now with more on her reporting. So, Julia, you did a deep dive here looking into these apparent smugglers social media posts. What did you find and how did these groups operate before social media? 
Well, the first thing we found was just how prolific it was. I mean, these were very easy to find. There are a lot of pages where these smugglers will just post all sorts of things, whether it's, you know, a hundred percent safe journey, telling people where to meet, giving their contact information, not exactly what you would expect from what we've sort of imagined to be these underground criminal organizations. Instead, you see just a lot of very open advertising in part because they know that there are so many people who are desperate to get to the United States and a lot of people may have left their home country and gotten as far as Mexico and then realized they can't do the rest of the journey. So we see a lot of these ads. And now it's not new for them to be using social media, but we do understand from experts who have been monitoring this for some time that they're using it more. And what this, how this changes the game is that smugglers used to operate maybe from one region or town. They would be responsible for getting people from one small town, say in Guatemala, to the U.S. Now with social media, you might not know the person you're hiring rather than relying on someone who you knew had brought a family member or a community member safely to the United States. You're now basically hiring a stranger that really doesn't have to rely on their reputation at all. And so things can go bad and go very dangerously from there. Julia, how aware of this is the Biden administration? Are they doing anything about it? They have acknowledged it before, and they actually are trying to kind of play on the same platform and beat them at their own game by trying to spread their own messages on Facebook. Not only have they taken out radio and TV ads in Central America, they are pushing messages on Facebook, telling immigrants this is not the time to come, and trying to combat some of the messages that they're seeing from smugglers who are telling immigrants now is the time to get into the United States. But of course, we know a lot of times misinformation spreads much more quickly on social media, and so it's hard just to combat the sheer volume of these ads and false messages. And Julia, how is Facebook reacting to this? Well, it's interesting. They took down all of the posts that we flagged. They it does violate their policies. And so if it's identified to them, they have a team that very quickly deletes it. But that doesn't change the trend just because NBC identified about 35 of these that we could easily find. We, As soon as they deleted them, more popped up. So that is their response. And it is against their terms of service. But again, it's volume. So they're really just playing whack-a-mole at this point, Joe. All right. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much for that report. Corporate America is pressuring red states to not go the way of Georgia, with CEOs of some of the nation's most influential companies speaking out against new voting laws. And Texas Republicans are not backing down from a battle. NBCNews.com senior political reporter Jane Tim joins us now. Jane, good morning. Now, one of the big moves we've seen here was the MLB pulling their all-star game from Atlanta in response to Georgia's new election laws. And the Texas governor is coming right out and criticizing Major League Baseball for that decision. Tell us what's going on going on here. Yeah, Governor Greg Abbott down in Texas said that he will not throw out last night the ceremonial first pitch at a Texas Rangers game, responding in kind to this sort of pullback because Texas, of course, is considering its own voting restrictions um, and, and really is gunning for a fight here. This is clearly um, an appetite to have this fight. You see, it is shameful that America's pastime is being polarized uh, by partisan politics. Now, politics are a part of everything we, we are have to do with corporations. Um, and Republicans have had a long, cozy relationship with corporate America, but they're really clashing with, the, with, with corporate America on this issue, on voting rights. Now, how does this showdown, though, test the limits of corporate pressure on lawmakers? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when you saw companies coming out against the law in Georgia, it was already law that, you know, that legislature mm -hmm. has adjourned. There's not much they can do. But when they came out in American Airlines and Michael Dell of Dell Technologies came out in Texas, it's about a law that was in, under consideration that was currently being heard in the legislature. So lawmakers, if they wanted to, have an opportunity to change what they're going to pass, to have a different conversation. It puts a lot more focus on a process and gets people who maybe agree with these corporations or advocates to be calling their lawmakers and saying, I don't want this passed into law. So whether you see this go, is is really really interesting in Texas, mm -hmm. and national Republicans are taking notice. I think we have a um, a little sound from Mitch McConnell about this. I found it completely discouraging to find a bunch of corporate CEOs uh, getting in the middle of politics. My advice to the corporate CEOs of America is to stay out of politics. Don't pick sides in these big fights. Savannah, this is a clash that is just waiting to happen, and I think it's going to happen in Texas first. 
Now, Jane, I think one big thing to note here is that these bills don't only include restrictive measures. They certainly do. But there are also some aspects that are somewhat expansive. There's been this discussion pointing out that aspects of Georgia's law, for example, are in fact more expansive than New York's voting laws. But the issue is the why and the when of those new restrictive parts of these measures. Expand on that for us. Of course. So when you see these companies going against a law like this, it's because they see it as a majority restrictive. Um, and Republican lawmakers, as you heard, you know, Greg Abbott say this is a false narrative and pointing to maybe the one or two small, expansive pieces of the law. I mean, these things don't have to be partisan politics. Experts tell me, you know, voting rights is not a red state or a blue state thing. There's parts of New York's laws that are incredibly anti-voter and there's parts of Georgia's laws that are incredibly, uh, you know, pro-voter. So... <laughs> What you have to do is look at what the reasoning is behind restrictive laws. And right now, it goes back to President Donald Trump's stolen election line. And that's what matters here. Jane, Tim, thank you so much. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC's Sarah Harmon joins us from London. Hey, Sarah, good morning. Ciao, Savannah. Good morning to both of you. Let's kick things off in Brazil, where residents of some of the poorest neighborhoods are protesting hunger and what they call the government's inadequate response to the economic effects of the coronavirus pandemic. Residents gathered with banners and empty pots as part of a demonstration organized by G10 Favelas, a group of Brazil's 10 biggest favelas. To the Olympics now, North Korea says it will not participate in the Tokyo Games because of the coronavirus pandemic. Guys, this decision puts an end to South Korea's hopes of using the Games to engage with the North amid stalled cross-border talks. And finally, check this out, steam and lava are sp It began erupting last month. Hundreds of hikers who'd come to see the spectacle had to be evacuated. Fortunately, guys, authorities say there is no immediate danger to human life. But nature's pretty powerful, so always pays to be careful. Joe, Savannah. Yeah. Absolutely. Those Don't pictures, get too close. Yeah, <laughs> those pictures get me every time. They're beautiful, but it's so intense looking. Sarah, thank you so much. The U.S. and Iran are holding indirect talks in Vienna today. It is a potential step toward returning to the nuclear deal between the countries. Negotiations are expected to center around Iran's nuclear enrichment and U.S.-imposed sanctions. NBC News Tehran Bureau Chief and Correspondent Ali Arouzi joins us now from Tehran. Ali, good morning. So again, these are indirect talks. So how will they work and how is each side approaching the negotiations? Good morning, Joe. Well, Iran has agreed to meet with the remaining signatories of the JCPOA, that's the UK, France, Germany, the EU, Russia and China, to see if they can resolve and revive the JCPOA, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal. But Iran is refusing to talk directly or even indirectly with the United States. Iran says that they'll, they'll make their case to the remaining members of the deal, and it's up to them if they want to share any of those conversations with the U.S. delegation. Now, the remaining parties to the deal will first meet at a Viennese hotel uh, for preparatory talks. The U.S. delegation, headed by Rob Malley, will be based in a nearby hotel, and expectations aren't particularly high on either side for a breakthrough. Let's take a listen to what State Department spokesman Ned Price uh, expected to come out of these talks. We don't underestimate the scale of uh, the challenges ahead. These are early days. Uh, we don't anticipate an early or immediate breakthrough, um, as these discussions we fully expect will be difficult. Um, but we do believe uh, that these discussions with our partners, and in turn our partners uh, with uh, Iran, is a healthy step, step forward. And, and Joe, Iran's government spokesman made similar comments this morning that Iran is neither optimistic nor pessimistic about the outcome of these talks, but feels confident about being on the right track to revive the nuclear deal as long as the U.S. is serious and fulfills its commitments. So, Ali, what are the main sticking points here? Well, the State Department says uh, that the focus of the Vienna talks will be uh, on the nuclear steps that Iran would need to take in order to return to compliance. 
uh, with the nuclear accord. In return, the U.S. would give synchronized sanctions relief, uh, a sort of step-by-step -step approach that will bring both sides back into compliance. Ned Price said that the Biden administration goal was to set the stage for a mutual return to compliance. But Iran says all sanctions have to be dropped first. And Ali, globally, what are the potential implications of what could possibly come out of these talks? Well, Joe, if Iran and world powers uh, manage to come to some sort of an agreement out of these talks, um, then, then it would bring Iran out of the cold, essentially. It will allow Iran to sell its oil on the open market and access the global financial system. Um, uh, and it may slow down Iran's shift towards the east, towards China, as Western companies may want to come back to Iran. But if it doesn't work out, more sanctions, more animosity and more tension. Ali Arouzi in Tehran. Ali, thank you so much. Coming up, much to the delight of thrill seekers across the globe, Mount Everest is now accepting climbers once again. We'll tell you how travelers are navigating the strenuous trek in the age of COVID next. It is time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Frank Holland joins us now. Frank, good morning. Hey, good morning to you guys. So we're going to talk a little bit of, uh, about the pandemic and e-commerce. And as the pandemic kept consumers at home, nearly everything they bought was purchased online. MasterCard is out with its latest Recovery Insights report, finding that shift amounted to an additional $900 billion being spent in retail online all across the world last year. E-commerce made up roughly about $1 out of every five spent. The report estimates 20 to 30 of the COVID-related shift to digital is expected to be permanent. The CEO of Norwegian Cruise Lines, he's very confident the company can safely set sail this summer for the first time in more than a year. He tells CNBC, cruise ships will de facto become the safest place on earth. Norwegian sent a proposal to the CDC with measures including requiring passengers and workers to be fully vaccinated weeks ahead of voyages and limiting capacity to 60%. Capacity would then be increased by 20% every 30 days afterwards. And diners are dipping back in, but ketchup just can't seem to catch up. Many restaurants are now facing a ketchup shortage. They're trying to secure the tabletop staple. After the pandemic, it really upended the industry, turning many to takeout and delivery only with individual ketchup packets as the primary condiment. Prices for those packets are up 13% since last January. Keep in mind, ketchup is the most consumed table sauce in restaurants <laughs> with about 300,000. Wait, tons, hey, tons so last year. I didn't double check that for a second. I've been here a couple of times, but each time I'm just like, really, tons? <laughs> We'll wait while you catch up. Yeah. yeah. Here's, here's another little tidbit. One billion spent at at-home ketchup eating. And, and thank you. I need to catch up. <laughs> well, that's good to know. We have all those little packets from carryout, so I'm hoarding them. And yeah, maybe selling them. I don't know what I'll do. It's yeah, funny. What do you have to do with that? I have noticed here at the NBC cafeteria, the brand changes a lot. I wonder oh, if it's uh, in reaction to Wherever the fact that... they can that, get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On the black market. All right. Commodity prices. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Frank. Thank you so much. The world's highest peak is open for business. Mount Everett's climbing season is officially underway. And while expedition organizers will monitor for COVID infections, the Sherpas leading climbers to the top say they haven't been vaccinated. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from London with more. Keir, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. The climbers are catching up with all the climbing they missed out on. Too much? <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, you know, if you want a demonstration... If you want a demonstration of the human spirit, uh, maybe look to Everest uh, this morning. You know, Nepal missed out on $2 billion worth of tourism industry last year, and many people lost their jobs. Now, controversially, they are welcoming back an eclectic crowd of climbers who say they're determined to beat the mountain and COVID. Mount Everest's majestic 26,000 feet high peak, attracting the world's adventurers once again this morning. Even a Bahraini prince posting with his entourage. Yeah. Our first views of Everest. Jess Weddle, a painter and cancer survivor, has traveled from Oklahoma City to the Himalayas. Everyone is so full of gratitude to be able to be here right now. 
She's climbing Everest for the first time in a year that for everyone promises new experiences. Are you already noticing the differences because of the different world we live in? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have different protocols than ever before. We kind of have our bubble. Um, we've done quarantining. Contrast that with the controversy of 2019, when pictures showed lines of climbers paying around $50,000 each and passing dead bodies. Now, Nepal says they have no choice but to open. More than 300 climbers are expected for a high-risk experience that's riskier than ever. Our Sherpa climbers are ready, but they have not received their vaccines, he says. Organizers say they will be monitoring for infections. We can see when symptoms occur. There are doctors on the way up as well. While those preparing their ascent believe it's about more than a mountain. After the last year, um, the whole world needs something to start dreaming and believing in again. For a world collectively climbing from the toughest of times, Everest this year once again set to symbolize triumph over adversity. Other protocols include testing, of course, before you even get into the country. And get this, uh, Joe and Savannah. One climber says he plans to wear a mask, surgical gloves and a surgical gown before he has to at some point put on that oxygen mask, guys. Wow. All right. Keir Simmons, thank you so much. All over the country, Americans are compulsively spending money on casino-style games they play on their phones. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward met one grandmother who lost her life savings on one of these games and is now suing to get it back. Kathleen Wilkinson is a five-foot-one grandma in rural Montana. Okay, so we got the sugar. I treat everybody with love. I mean, you come to my house, I'll bake you cookies. You know, I'm, I'm that kind of grandma person. But in 2016, she injured her spine. I had to stay off of work. I was at home and bored. And an ad for a slot machine style game popped up on Facebook. At first it was fun. And then I started spending money on it a little bit. And then it got to be more and more. All told, Wilkinson says she spent $50,000 in the app and that it ruined her life. You become addicted like anybody that had never been in a casino before and they go back there every single day. Play your favorite slots. Wilkinson was playing a social casino game Start called Double Down. Down. Games like this combine the mechanics of gambling with social features like text and video chat. The apps charge money for more features and more chances to play. But here's the thing, while users spend real money, they can't win any back. NBC News interviewed more than 20 players of games like these who reported spending anywhere from $10,000 to $400,000. Double Down did not respond to our interview requests, but millions of people play their games each month. Double Down Casino is one of the top grossing apps across multiple uh, platforms. It's pretty awesome to be able to work on a product that you know millions and millions of people are going to see. The company reported annual revenue of more than a quarter billion dollars last year and boasts in financial documents that once a player is acquired, our proprietary analytic tools dissect their playing behavior on a granular level, driving them to play and spend more. Attorney Jay Edelson, who represents Wilkinson, recently reached a $155 million settlement in a class action lawsuit against a Double Down competitor called Big Fish Casinos. His firm is now suing Double Down. These social casinos are targeting people who are most likely to have uh, to be addicts and then taking their life savings. These aren't rich people. These are people who are ordinary, hardworking people. In a statement to NBC News, Big Fish wrote in part, our games are offered for free, purely for entertainment, with an opportunity for customers to spend money within the game to enhance their gameplay experience. And these games are not gambling. Professor Natasha Shul studies machine gambling and says that these apps and slots on the casino floor are equally addictive. There's really no difference in the experience of the gamblers. And I really think the experience of the gamblers needs to be the metric for harm and for addiction. You can see the signature of addiction in the data that is being um, so robustly collected by these companies. 
This place is Wilkinson's paradise, and she'd been planning a peaceful retirement. But with her $50,000 gone and her husband ill, she'll now have to work well into their golden years. Okay, tell me if it needs anything. And I wish to God I had not spent that money because I'm worrying about being able to take care of my husband. It's, it's the worst feeling in the world to be scared. I just wish they would do the right thing and give back the money.